All right, well, welcome um, to our four experts who are joining us to help us sort through the complex web of issues that are involved in the topic of, uh, quote, the role of university industry relationships in universities research missions. Um, that's a quite a mouthful and it's a complicated topic, but fortunately for us, we have, um, and I'll first list them in alphabetical order, um, a uh, really fabulous group of folks to help us sort through the questions. We have Marianne Feldman, who is the Henninger Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina. And by the way, all of the bios for these um, very, very accomplished individuals are on our website. So I'm just gonna give a one sentence introduction um, to go through their bios would occupy, I think almost all of our panel because they've all, all of these individuals have done so much. So next we have Carl Koster, um, who is the executive vice president for R and D. I'm sorry, <laughs> is the executive direct or was the recently the executive director of the industrial liaison program at MIT and um, just recently stepped down from that role. Um, then we have David Reese, who is the executive, lots of executives here, um, executive vice president for R and D at Amgen. And then finally, um, certainly not least, we have our own Sandy Williams, who's a senior advisor for science and technology at Duke University, um, just recently finished up a turn as the head of the Office for Research and Innovation here at Duke, and also has had many roles in the past, um, too many to go through. So um, that's the alphabetical order. Um, in terms of the speaking order, we will start with Carl Koster, then move to David Reese, then go to Sandy Williams and close um, the uh, affirmative presentations with Marianne Feldman. Each in, uh, speaker will have about 10 minutes um, per our usual um, approach in, the, in these panels. And then we'll open the floor for questions um, from the audience, which you should also feel free to contribute throughout the panel because we will be monitoring the Q&A feed. So again, the order of the speakers is Carl, Sandy, David, and Marianne. So let me give the floor to Carl. Well, thank you, Artie, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, to carry on your disclaimer, uh, yes, I was the uh, Executive Director of Corporate Relations at MIT, uh, stepped down in, uh, in February. The corporate relations comprises both the industrial liaison program, which is a corporate affiliate program with over 160 uh, company members. It's been around since 1948 and MIT Startup Exchange, which is a platform that I can go into later with over uh, 1200 MIT connected companies that we're linking with the large corporates. Uh, and in addition, um, I had responsibility as director of uh, um, alliance management in an office of strategic alliances and technology transfer, which I'll describe in a little more detail later. Um, so I guess that's another way of saying that um, I'm speaking from a personal perspective now. I'm not speaking on behalf of MIT. So uh, please take that into consideration if I'm a little provocative from time to time. In any event, uh, just as background, MIT, as, as many of you may know, um, is a, a land grant college. And so it's always been focused on impact and supporting economic development through education and research since the 1860s. Um, currently, industry represents about 28% of the overall research volume at MIT. So last fiscal year, that was $176 million in industry-sponsored research. If you uh, roll in um, executive education, the corporate relations function that I manage, uh, grants and gifts. It's well over $350 million a year uh, from industry through various uh, financial arrangements. And so uh, plays a, a very, very big role in MIT strategy and the kinds of initiatives we put together over the years. Um, to put that in further context, uh, MIT has the highest percentage of non-federal uh, revenue sources uh, compared to its peers and the highest research volume when peer institutions uh, without medical schools, as I know Duke has and, and others, is um, um, factored in. So again, very, very focused on um, 
expanding our uh, impact through industry connections and others as well. So over the, the 30 or so years that I was at MIT, we've continued to see a sea change in the mix of, of financial sponsors of MIT. So as you can imagine, after World War II and the Cold War, you know, well over 90% of the research volume of MIT, as with Stanford and many other schools, was from the US federal government. Uh, that's down more like 60% of the total research volume at MIT. And what you've seen at MIT is a growth in the percentage and the absolute value of uh, research sponsorship from industry sources, as I just mentioned, but also other sources as well, like international organizations, a set of uh, foundations, which are increasingly focused on sponsoring research, interacting in a, in a way um, more like corporations in terms of the kinds of uh, terms and conditions they'd like to see in research contracts. Um, and MIT, uh, about three years ago now, we said, well, are we organized to take advantage of the changing nature of the funding sources that we've seen growing and continuing to grow? We project will likely grow some more. And so uh, if I could share screen, uh, Artie, uh, let me share the uh, an organization we put together. As I say, it's been about Two years ago, we launched it just before the pandemic really hit. So we sort of took a hit in implementation of, uh, of the structure, but, uh, but we've had great progress and we continue to uh, ramp up the staffing on that. So let me share a screen if I might. Should be able to, yeah. Can Excellent. we see that? Yes, we can. Okay. So what we did was we essentially said, okay, um, our our contracting for research um, was not keeping pace with the changing mix of um, uh, research that we were receiving. Uh, so previously where the federal government was the major source of, of funding of research, we had a set of people in what was then our Office of Sponsored Programs uh, that were very familiar with the terms and conditions for the various federal agencies. But of course, with the mix changing as rapidly as it, as it did and as growth has continued, we realized we didn't have the right set of people in our Office of Sponsored Programs to keep pace with the increasing complexity of the, the negotiations that are required with the different mix of research sponsors. Uh, and frankly, we didn't have the, the right number of staff. So we did a benchmarking against uh, comparable universities and realized that we didn't have the right number of staff for the growth in, uh, in, in research, uh, nor did we have the mix of uh, skill sets that we would need to negotiate with industry, different industries, foreign governments, uh, foundations, and the like? So we organized in the following manner that is, is in this chart. We combined the um, technology licensing office and the office of corporate relations that I used to manage, as, as was mentioned. Uh, they, we had been reporting up to an associate provost. This happened uh, when we launched the last the campaign. Corporate relations moved out of resource development. Uh, to great uh, success, I might say. Uh, TLO also moved out of the vice president for research under both of us under new associate provost, uh, currently um, Kristen Van Vliet. Uh, and then we came together and we said, well, how are we gonna restructure the Office of Sponsored Programs? And that essentially was broken into two pieces. One piece, which I won't go in today, was is research administrative services. And this is uh, focused on federal and government uh, contracting sources. Uh, so those are separate from this. They report to the vice president for research. And then under the associate provost, I and Leslie Miller Nicholson, who runs the technology licensing officer, brought together and we created uh, a team of what we're calling OSAT, Office of Sponsored uh, Alliance, uh, Strategic Alliances Technology Transfer. Uh, OSAT core, which consists of three elements, a catalyst team, a strategic transactions team, and alliance management team. And the idea here is that we've set up a team of people who are well-versed in um, uh, technology. And Leslie uh, from the TLO has taken charge of hiring those people, of course, with input from the rest of us, a set of catalysts. So the, what are the catalysts doing? So once a, uh, uh, an opportunity is identified where a principal investigator uh, and a sponsor have come together, had a discussion, and have said, in principle, we'd like to do some sponsored research. A catalyst is brought in to help flesh out the scope of work, to understand upfront what are some of the, the issues that may arise, intellectual property, 
uh, non-disclosure, uh, material transfer, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and to map out um, the scope of work that will achieve what both the sponsor and the MIT uh, principal investigator hope to achieve. That is then uh, passed over to the strategic transactions team. These are the lawyers. So these are the people who, instead of taking an off the shelf uh, set of terms and conditions that might be appropriate for the Department of Energy, they will craft a uh, individualized agreement that reflects uh, our knowledge of the interests of the PI and the uh, sponsor. And the idea is that will uh, foster a more rapid and productive discussion to come to terms on the, uh, the agreement, the right agreement, the elements of the agreement that makes sense for both sides. And then for the ones that are more complex, the, the multi-million dollar, multi-hundred thousands of dollars, multiple PI, uh, perhaps multiple sponsors, uh, that where there is a lot of complexity in the governance and the management of these, there's an alliance management team that I set up, uh, and their job is to help uh, launch uh, rapidly those agreements. So we had a major agreement um, about two years ago with Takeda. Uh, it was launched uh, multi-million dollar per year, but we wanted to launch it with an RFP process very quickly. And so uh, the alliance management team helped to set that up. Uh, went out with uh, job descriptions for the uh, executive directors that were executive director and the staff who would support that uh, and really set it up in a way that allowed for a, a rapid launch. And then, and then on either side, you have the licensing office that would deal with the post uh, patent issues after contract corporate relations is a really a business development function, which also works on the front end with the catalysts, as we found out because a lot of these opportunities that come to pass are uh, uh, either PI driven, sponsor driven, corporate relations driven, uh, staff in the other parts of MIT driven. So we wanna make sure that we have a, a, a fluid, uh, transparent set of communication uh, efforts and systems in place to help that. And so I guess I'll stop there. I don't wanna take up all the time on this, but. This is the, the structure we, we report, OSAT reports up to where you can see at the top, our chancellor, executive vice president, uh, VPs for research, finance, resource development. Uh, we have a, a general counsel. So the strategic transactions team, the head of that has a uh, dotted line as it will to a general counsel. And so we're uh, very much at the, at the center of MIT uh, strategy with respect to uh, making MIT even a more hopefully um, easier place to deal with. I know we haven't maybe had the reputation as being the easiest place to deal with as part of universities, but our hope is that this process will streamline that process. And I think we're seeing uh, very positive results in, in the couple of years we've set up. And as things open up, um, I, I think that we'll see uh, great progress. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll end by just saying, just before I left in corporate relations, we um, restarted uh, our on-campus events and conferences. And I have never seen such excitement of people wanting to get back and come together in person with, with others around topics of interest. It's just, it's been electric. So um, hopefully that, will, I'm sure that will continue, but I think that bodes for a bright future for industry university relations going forward. I'll stop sharing. Terrific, thanks so much. Uh, next, we'll move on to David Reese. Great, uh, you know, hello everyone, I'm Dave Reese. I'm the head of research and development uh, at Amgen. And, you know, th the topic today for us in many ways is a lifeblood. Uh, you know, we have thousands uh, of collaborations, uh, the, you know, which are part of a, a broader ecosystem that fuels the, the life sciences industry and in, in particular drug discovery and development. We can think of, I sort of think of that as, you know, as a table with four legs, academia, industry, government, and then the venture uh, community. Of course, I, I, I interact with academic institutions and governments around the world uh, in this role. And many, of, uh, many places outside the United States ask me, you know, why can't we get a biotechnology industry going? Well, it's usually because one or more of those legs uh, is not present and you know, they're all necessary but not sufficient. So 
you know, industry, academia, collaboration, relationships, where does it fit in here? Well, first of all, you know, perhaps it's worthwhile describing what kinds of partnerships we have, because there's a huge range, you know, from simple material transfer agreements, you know, swapping reagents uh, bi-directionally. You know, this is part of normal scientific discourse uh, and collaboration. Scientific collaboration, which is off, you know, often laboratory to laboratory. Uh, again, you know, standard kind of collaboration that we would think of that could be university to university for that matter. Here it happens to be industry with university. Then we have sometimes larger arrangements that I might call a strategic collaboration where we have a, you know, for instance, uh, a basket of assets in a disease area. And we have a collaboration with an institution that involves both preclinical, so basic science, bench work, and early clinical work to really try to sort out in these early phases of drug discovery and drug development, what's working, what's not working, uh, and why. Then there are clinical research collaborations. You know, we do you know, studies involving many tens of thousands of patients around the world each year. Many, you know, the majority of those research sites are academic uh, institutions. And so that range of clinical collaboration itself can take many forms. Uh, and then I would say increasingly, you know, what I would call collaborations around data and data sciences. So you've heard the terms real world evidence uh, or real world data. Uh, many university health systems now are a node in a much broader health system and have now you know, electronic health records and access to information on tens or hundreds of thousands or in some cases millions uh, of patients that can provide you know, deep insights into patterns of care, what's really working in the real world, what isn't working. And of course, that uh, uh, is invaluable to us in terms of, again, further drug discovery and drug development. So it's this entire range, and I think it's actually about to explode uh, uh, and you know, take, take another step forward. Why is that? Well, I, I firmly believe that you know, in this industry and in the life sciences more broadly, we are at, you know, what I like to call a hinge moment, you know, one where we'll look back in 10 or 20 years and say, things started to change then. What do we mean by that? Well, we're seeing the union of tech, data sciences, and biotech. And that is going to absolutely fuel drug discovery and drug development. So now we have partnerships with, you know, companies like, you know, Google or Facebook, you know, would have been, you know, you know unthinkable <laughs> many years ago, but their expertise in artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, are now directly applicable to what we are trying to do. Well, that's incredibly important in terms of university relationships, because now it's not just lab to lab or clinical research, but potentially this giant uh, new frontier of data sciences, computer science, uh, et cetera. It also, I think, opens up um, you know, the, the scope of collaboration to potentially much more geographic variation. Uh, because you know what we call dry labs, which is a fancy word for saying somebody with a computer uh, who knows how to use it in a sophisticated fashion, you know, can be located anywhere. And you know, and uh, you know, folks now, you know, we're collaborating with folks who, um, uh, uh, you know, across the globe in that kind of collaboration. So I think we're at, at a moment where these sorts of collaborations are going to take another leap forward uh, and we'll have to qualitatively think about you know how we make uh, you know those arrangements so you know I'll go ahead and stop there this is a topic I'm really passionate about I, I think it is absolutely fundamental to, to all of our success uh, you know, but I'll turn things back to uh, Artie at this point terrific and I will turn things over to our third speaker Sandy Williams who uh, will also speak for about 10 minutes. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Artie. Uh, I'm going to begin with some first principles 
uh, that address some issues on which one might think all reasonable people should agree, but in fact, they don't. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start out that way. And then I'm going to uh, conclude with some actions recommended for all of the key parties in this ecosystem, uh, as, as you've heard from Dave, uh, universities, industry, uh, including uh, venture firms and, and, and government. Uh, now, no one should question that innovation is the lifeblood of a vibrant economy and a healthy society and that universities are, are a rich source of innovation. Uh, my own field of biomedicine provides many examples of how academic industry partnerships serve society. Uh, most important new medicines trace their origins, uh, and I wrote a paper about this a few years ago, so this is not just a, uh, this quantitative information supporting this, but most important new medicines trace their origins to decades of research that are carried out largely within universities but no university can command the capital and expertise required to turn biological discoveries into FDA approved medicines available globally to patients that need. Uh, and happily, uh, we saw this ecosystem operate in real time to generate effective countermeasures to prevent and treat SARS-CoV-2. Nevertheless, opinions can differ markedly as to how university-based discoveries and inventions can best be translated to reach the public via the commercial marketplace. Some university faculty members hold the viewpoint that universities should focus almost entirely on education and research, and that research should be conducted purely to generate new knowledge without explicit regard to the utility of that knowledge in the real world. Some university faculty members and administrators regard applied or translational research as intellectually inferior to basic or pure research and hold that relationships with industry are inherently corrupting, ripe with moral hazard and replete with risks that are not justified by the likely benefits. In contrast, many university faculty members are themselves adroit serial entrepreneurs and or enthusiastic partners with investors and industry groups. And some university leaders, and I'm clearly in this camp, uh, regard the purposeful translation of university-based innovation into real-world outcomes as an essential feature of the public service mission of the university. Encouragement of this latter viewpoint was a primary intent of the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. Now, in the, week of, in the wake of Bayh-Dole, virtually all universities established offices to promote technology transfer from academia to industry. And they developed policies and procedures for managing intellectual property and distributing royalties earned from licenses and patents. However, only a few universities have experienced a groundswell of faculty interest and ambition for translational accomplishment, have created effective supporting functions, and have realized some fa famously spectacular success stories. But other universities have achieved less in this sphere. Academic reward systems often are slanted heavily to discourage translational activity. Tech transfer offices uh, often are focused on short-term licensing revenue rather than value creation. And policies still exist and are common today that serve to obstruct rather than promote entrepreneurship and uh, partnerships with industry. Now, happily, several trends favorable to a robust ecosystem for innovation are evident inside universities. Increasingly, many of our best young faculty are successfully adding a translational dimension to their academic research. And pleasingly, highly accomplished individuals now move fluidly back and forth between positions in academia and industry. That never happened only uh, uh, a few decades ago. Um, and universities, uh, you know, as you heard, heard, heard from Carl, are intensifying their support for entrepreneurship and corporate partnerships, and they're developing more rational and effective policies and mechanisms for managing conflicts of interest and other risks. Um, and finally, I think universities and their industry partners are recognizing and realizing value from strategic partnerships that far transcend uh, traditional licensing agreements. So those are the good, that's the good news. Disappointingly, there are other trends that serve to increase headwinds to effective innovation. 
Uh, opposition to scientific reasoning prevails among a shockingly large segment of the American electorate. The definition of what is patentable is shrinking or uncertain. Uh, irrational pricing practices imposed by payers and pharmacy benefit managers inhibit equitable access to effective new medicines. Immigration policies are restricting access by foreign nationals to US universities and security concerns threaten multinational collaborations. And then down at the faculty level, just the, the demands of teaching, fundraising for academic research, regulatory compliance, sometimes crowd out the space available for entrepreneurship or industry collaboration among our faculty. So what can and should we do to enhance our collective ability to solve big problems in health, environment, communications, economics, national security, that can only be solved by conjoint actions between academia and industry, and that would promote, if successful, prosperity and social justice within the society. So I'm gonna close by suggesting a few actions to this end on behalf of universities, industry, and government. So first, universities. Universities should be proactive in creating in the following ways foster a culture of innovation uh, among, uh, among faculty and support its translation. This calls for adjusting reward structures such as tenure and endowed professorships to encourage translation. We heard a bit about that from university presidents yesterday. We need to build capabilities to encourage, simplify, and streamline channels of communication to explore, frame, close, and sustain academic industry partnerships. Uh, we heard how MIT has been a leader in setting up those kind of structures. Um, and I, uh, I am a huge proponent that universities need to actively seek deeply rooted, multifactorial, sustained relationships with industry groups that move beyond patent licensing to solve big problems together. Uh, universities need to have practices that accommodate the legitimate needs of commercial enterprises for confidentiality, timely decision making, accountability, and delivery of agreed upon outcomes. And universities need to meet companies halfway in assessing and reacting to risks. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Duke aspires to be best practices in all of these areas, and we're taking fresh and decisive actions to realize those ambitions. Uh, that includes some of the principles uh, that, that you heard about earlier. Uh, Duke does uh, upwards of $1.2 billion in externally sponsored research. Uh, somewhat north of 200 million comes from industry. Uh, so we're a relatively large player uh, in this field. Now, let me turn and make some recommendations to our industry colleagues. Uh, I'd call on industry representatives to think strategically as well as transactionally in forging relationships with universities. Uh, this happens, as Dave has nicely noted, uh, not uh, uncommonly, but many of the relationships don't come up to that standard. I think uh, industry representatives need to uh, work a bit harder in understanding the cultural dynamics among university-based innovators and the distributed nature of decision-making and fund flows within universities that uh, just make us fundamentally different from the way decisions are made uh, in industry often. Uh, and industry partners need to accommodate the legitimate needs of universities to fully recover indirect costs. We heard from the presidents about that yesterday and to protect our tax exempt status. And industry uh, reps need to meet the universities halfway in seeking strategic relationships and in assessing and reacting to risks. And then finally, what about government? It's quite clear that government action or non-action will be a major determinant of the strength of our innovation ecosystem in the future. Uh, federal support of university-based discovery and invention is the lifeblood that drives the whole innovation process. Uh, the budget of NSF, NIH, and uh, DARPA and other programs should never become a political football. Um, likewise, state governments need to come into play and some have and some haven't. Uh, there's many that have demonstrated the clear value of supporting innovation at the state level. Uh, and I hope that others will follow suit. And then finally on the legal front, uh, our law school is sponsoring this event. The spirit and intent of the Bayh-Dole Act is threatened uh, and it needs to be firmly protected 
and expanded by other public policy and legal actions that broaden the safe haven for universities to form partnerships in the public interest with industry without jeopardy to their tax exempt status. Patent law uh, in practice is uh, going in the wrong direction, I believe on many fronts, and that needs to uh, adjust to avoid stifling innovation that serves society. Um, and finally, we need government agencies to do a better job of rationalizing policies relating to immigration and transnational collaborations that protect national security interests without constraining the flow in talent and academic freedoms that drive meritorious innovation. And finally, we need all parties, universities, industry, and government to draw out talent from members of historically underrepresented groups. So thanks, and I look forward to our subsequent discussion. Thanks very much. And uh, Marianne, you are next. Very good. And so this has been a great panel and it's an exciting time to be looking at these issues because right now the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act is going through reconciliation. This is gonna be a huge investment in universities. So I'm a little different I think than other members of the panel in that I'm an academic and I've been studying technology-based economic development with a specific concern about places and how places do. Just reveal my age to you and that I was a graduate student when Baidol passed. And I thought that this was so incredibly exciting because this was going to set in place a new system for American prosperity. And so we were seeing, if you will, a way to leverage universities to create economic development. That's, we have 40 years experience with this now. And so, um, you know, the question is, as we put more money on the system, how do we do better? And so um, I really like that um, David said, universities are necessary, but not sufficient. I have to tell you that when I, um, sort of started, I thought, well, this is the way this will work is we'll have university technologies, they'll move out of the lab, we'll have startup firms, startup firms will create new industries, and this will create new prosperity in America. But we now have income inequality, and it is um, very spatially prominent. It's just unsustainable. And so I think that, you know, sort of what matters when we think about how to make universities more effective is that, and again, you know, I sort of liked Carl's discussion of how we sort of internally organize at a university. Our internal processes matter a lot. Also, we've talked about the external ecosystems and their relevance. Um, and I think that that is um, some place, you know, we've seen pockets of prosperity around university towns in, say, the heartland, in places where income inequality is um, the most acute. But these pockets of prosperity do not spread out, and they really are not creating opportunities for most Americans. Um, I also want to offer this just provocative observation that we rely so much on venture capital financing, but venture capital financing does not help to build places. In fact, what it does is it relocates firms to those centers of venture capital, traditionally Silicon Valley, but increasingly capital centers in New York City. Now, going back and looking at Baidol, it's just remarkable to me because Baidol is an unfunded mandate. Okay, universities were given the ability to license intellectual property that resulted from federal discoveries, but you know there was no funding provided to manage this process, and so. Um, well, I think looking at this, that the universities that do well at this have benefited from home runs. And a lot of that is due to luck. It is not, I mean, probably MIT, 
Carl is the exception because MIT has never had one of these sort of big home runs, but they've had, you know, all, have done very well at sort of managing relationships. But, you know, think about University of Florida, we think about all of these technologies. And we know this about innovation, that innovative outcomes are incredibly skewed, that we have some, you know, sort of, um, products that have big impact. We have some companies that have high valuations, but those are pretty rare events. And when we look at how universities are funding their tech transfer offices, I mean, there's only a handful of them that even break even, right? Many offices and many of the university offices that are located in states where we have the greatest economic needs are operating on a shoestring. And so um, I think that, you know, this is where you guys had mentioned governors could be involved and could help to fund these operations. And then, you know, um, that would sort of, again, help to diffuse prosperity. Um, the idea of, um, you know, our offices of technology licensing are changing and evolving. The idea of the evolution, right, is part of this panel. And so we know other sources of financing are becoming more important. And the offices are, are adapting and taking on this greater function of economic development. And really um, building an ecosystem to support industry, and this is going to be inherently local, has become very important. To me, one of the most successful places is Carnegie Mellon, um, in that they have really, and it's my alma mater, so I've been watching it over all these years, but they have really um, invested a lot in um, external relations and trying to build industry parks. And Carnegie Mellon does very well with their technology licensing because of two big hits, but without a medical school, they have created a lot of strategic alliances and joint programs with the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I want to mention also that when we, you know, we sort of say, oh, it's culture. And I used to think it was culture. But you know, right now I wanna say that the American professorate is exhausted. That what we have seen is a decline in the, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend yesterday's session, but a decline in tenured professors, tenure track jobs, and a proliferation of many different roles. And so faculty are increasingly on a treadmill where they're just trying to secure funding. And this doesn't allow them to engage in the fundamental research that has been the traditional specialization of universities in the um, system of innovation. And I think that you know, we are, will be putting a lot more money into universities trying to create regional innovation clusters um, where we ought to be creating regional innovation ecosystems, but without recognizing that it is the faculty who are our most important uh, resource, then we are not going to get um, the benefits that we are hoping for. Thank you. Thank oh, thanks so much, Marianne. I wasn't sure whether you were entirely done or whether you had, we were taking a pause. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Well, this is just a terrific set of opening presentations. So much fodder for discussion. So I'm going to start um, with a question that I will initially direct towards Carl, but obviously everyone should jump in because everyone sounded similar themes um, because we all know the data. The data suggests that at least pending um, any boost we get from USICA or the, you know, whatever the reconciliation package comes, although that's just an authorization, not an appropriation as everyone knows. Um, um, you know, federal funding has gone down. Uh, federal funding of both basic and applied research over the last 10 years or so has been either stable in inflation adjusted dollars or actually declining. And then as a percentage of total funding obviously has gone down. So industry is funding a lot more. And so a question for Carl, uh, to what extent is this shifting at MIT just a recognition of that reality um, 
because you know cold hard dollars make you recognize reality. Well, um, you know, MIT, unlike a lot of other places, really lived off of its cash flow. And that's uh, very much uh, characterized as MIT. It's a research driven university. And so uh, you have to, uh, some of the points that were made early by Mary Ann, uh, you know, faculty are, in order to achieve tenure, are constantly looking for uh, support. And uh, as the situation has changed, as you said, with uh, many people wondering, you know, uh, is the, uh, the lack of growth and the, the decrease in federal funding of research, uh, I think a lot of people think that's a long-term trend. And so we've had to work to find uh, new sources of funding. So as I said, industry is part of that mix, but it's not the only part. So we've had a number of international collaborations, a lot of other universities have as well in uh, Singapore, uh, you know, others in the Middle East, I mean, it, it, Europe, I mean, that's it, been another a growth area that a lot of universities have had to uh, look at. I really feel uh, badly for a lot of the state schools as well, because a lot of them relied upon uh, state funding, which I think has created even more than, uh, than federal funding has as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a, a reflection of the need to, um, uh, to, to interact. I, another thing that's a little bit different from MIT, um, somewhat in contrast to what Sandy said, is that, you know, we're mostly, not exclusively, but the majority of the faculty are in engineering. And so the engineering faculty, uh, unlike, I would say, um, the scientific community, let's say the School of Science, um, are very focused often on um, leading edge you know, innovation, but they realize it needs to be in partnership, particularly with industry, because industry is the only group along with governments that are gonna be able to scale whatever it is they come up with to really have an impact on society. Uh, that's, uh, I think, changing as well to David's point um, on it being a hinge moment, uh, because we are seeing these incredible partnerships develop between uh, universities, hospitals, uh, the private sector, and that's all going to, I think, an explosion of innovation. At the end of the day, you know, I think, um, again, coming back to what Marianne said, I think IP is overrated as a, as a factor to focus on. I think you know, uh, as you say, the number of, of patents that result in multi-million dollar uh, revenue stream is very, very few. MIT's philosophy is you patent everything, unless it's clearly not going to make a difference. You patent it all, and and because you, you can't predict uh, what it'll be. I mean, there are some industries. I think the pharmaceutical industry is one where patenting the uh, the actual molecule is critical. I get that from, but for most other uh, industries. Patenting is not, not where, it's, where, where it's at is, again, to David's point, it's relationships. How do you build the trusting relationships with multiple stakeholders that can generate the kind of mutually beneficial outcomes we all want? So do other folks want to jump in on the question of the MIT model and to what extent it's dictated by cold, hard cash flows over the last decade? Um, and relatedly, I, I think, um, and Carl, you can also come back to this. Um, will other universities also follow that model, essentially setting up a, a separate shop for corporate sponsored research and all those relationships? Maybe I can say a word here that's a very sort of simple, pragmatic word. The one thing that really can expedite the ability to set up partnerships is number one, having a central point of contact, which Carl has described in a central office where we get to know them, they get to know us. Uh, and then number two, actually you know, setting up master agreements yeah. so that 95% of the negotiation is completed. And if there is a new project, it can be a letter of agreement or you know, an amendment or a few specifics where we run into challenges and where it really slows things down is if every partnership has to be a one-off negotiated from scratch. And so, I, I mean, you know, this is not rocket science, but it is incredibly important in making things easier uh, and removing gunk from the works. Those are two absolutely central elements of why we reorganized the way we did, David. Absolutely central. 
I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And that those are the principles that we're applying in the reorganization at Duke. Mm -hmm. uh, what, one point that uh, Frank made, I wanna come back and double down on <clears throat> is the realization that uh, patents are not uh, no longer, if they ever were, the, the primary currency or basis for these partnerships. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of university practices are mired in that era. Uh, so I, I, that I think is one of the most uh, important lessons of how do we uh, structure and streamline and move swiftly to form the right kinds of strategic partnerships uh, with the realization that they're, they're not all about uh, licensing. I'd like to bring in uh, the element of um, student education and training students and giving them opportunities to work with industry. Um, you know, the sort of biggest tech transfer event at any university is graduation day. And so for students to sort of realize that this is their, their future and that they will um, have these opportunities. I've been really impressed by the growth of specialized programs at universities that um, cater to the needs of local industry. And I think that that creates um, a synergy that's very important. So I think that we, you know, why do universities exist? Well, it is to create and transfer ideas and that we have to keep education front and center. Well, so Marianne, your, your views were very much articulated by our keynote speaker, Michael Crow, who suggested that universities, their first and foremost mission should be education. So as to spread the students out to industry. Um, I don't know if anyone was watching Michael Crow's speech, but he actually accused um, elite universities of perhaps not being as good at that as some of the less renowned universities, shall we say. Um, so in any event, that's, that's just a, a comment on the side. Um, uh, so we have a, a bunch of questions that relate to the intersection of the university mission and the, the mission to improve economic growth. Um, which was very much an articulated mission of by Dole um, to the perhaps slightly different scenario we're living in now. And our, um, our earlier panel was definitely uh, very focused on that slightly different scenario. Um, and, and actually, are we living in a different scenario where security issues and some of the concerns about security will make the by Dole framework a little bit rele less relevant than the, it was in 1980, where the issue was just economic competitiveness. I don't think there was a concern, or certainly as much of a concern with um, with national security. Although, feel free to differ. So currently, the Department of Energy has a circular on extraordinary circumstances, right? I don't know if this has come up before, but um, this could become a blueprint for other agencies funding university research. And the idea is that um, spinoff companies would be required to stay um, in the United States. And so, um, you know, I think that these, these uh, questions become uh, more complicated as we think about, well, what do we want to get from this? And if it is to increase um, prosperity, then we would need jobs. And that would require um, reshoring um, American manufacturing and really keeping, I think too many times the discoveries from American universities have been commercialized elsewhere and commercialized in Asia, and we've not re uh, recognized the benefits. But we are at an, I think an exciting time, but it's also a time where we need to weigh in because of the reconciliation that's going on right now. I'm more concerned about uh, recent trends that restrict 
access by foreign nationals to our universities. If any of you heard uh, Professor Freeman's talk yesterday where he analyzed the uh, backgrounds of key people who participated in the uh, generation of effective uh, COVID vaccines, uh, almost all of them, wherever their point of origin had had a period of time at a US university. Um, and uh, so I, I'm concerned that uh, we actually act against the long-term national security by these immigration restrictions. Um, I'm also concerned that heavy-handed action uh, by the FBI and Department of Justice in uh, ferreting out what they believe to be inappropriate uh, relationships between US-based professors uh, and other countries, mostly China. Uh, that there are legitimate uh, security concerns in that space, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, practices have lined up rationally uh, with protecting those. And if the overall climate uh, shuts down uh, otherwise highly meritorious multinational collaborations, we'll end up having done the wrong thing. It's a complicated right. issue. It's a complicated issue. We at MIT, I mean, we have a process for a certain country just that you could imagine where we're reviewing every sponsored research uh, uh, proposal uh, on an individual basis to determine um, the risk and whether we want to proceed or not. So we've had to assemble a, a process that, that again, looks at in a very discreet manner, each and every um, proposal that might be sensitive. That's appropriate. Are you talking, um, Carl, about um, industry sponsored research or are you also talking about- No, any, it could, be, it could be with a foreign university, for example, or really any, 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 any sponsor that, that is associated with uh, particularly uh, a sensitive country, for example. And that's, David, just, gonna, that's just going to increase. Huh? That, that's not yeah. going away. I think we just have to deal with, with that. And we have very, you know, export control uh, regulations are changing all the time. And, you know, different companies are put on different watch lists. So we have a very uh, increasingly set of processes to uh, do due diligence. Uh, even to the level of, uh, you know, who is on uh, what board and what are the boards are they on in other companies? And is, is that relationship sufficient to uh, disqualify a proposal? Think of the Russian oligarchs, for example. Well, so yeah, we had a, a, a rousing discussion of some of the issues that Russia now poses. Um, we were focused initially on China, but um, certainly the other countries. So another question that we've had um, from several people relates to some of the issues that David Reese brought up with respect to data-based collaboration. And on that, um, David Reese, I will start with you, but you should, um, everyone else should jump in as, as they would like. Um, are there things that, we talked about the, the ways that government is part of one leg of the stool, everyone is using this stool metaphor um, or you know, the leg metaphor in any event, any event throughout our conference. Um, but we have, so, but we mostly talk about funding. Is there a role that regulatory agencies could play to facilitate the kinds of partnerships and data that you focused on, uh, David Reese, um, so as to support clinical development of new therapeutics? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the FDA has actually just issued a series of guidances uh, in the last year on the use of real world evidence and real world data as part of the uh, as part of drug development. So, you know, that's a that is an area of you know scientific exploration whose time has come. Uh, and in fact, there is a tsunami uh, of data now starting to wash over us. The question is how to use it. You know, maybe I can bring up an example. We haven't used the P word yet, pandemic, uh, but there were um, you know, real 
there are real lessons to take from what has happened in the last few years uh, that define what I might call the art of the possible. You know, we saw this sort of unprecedented collaboration between the various legs of the stool, you know, in particular academia, industry, and government to speed the development of vaccines and therapeutics in record time. You know, I was part of a group of, uh, you know, a small number, you know, kind of a handful uh, of my peers and I got together in very early March uh, of 2020 when, you know, we all knew what was coming at that point. Uh, and we said, look, you know, we've got an immense amount of brain power uh, and an immense, you know, set of resources at our command. What are we going to try to do together? That body then expanded to sort of, you know, 20, 25 heads of R&D and began then interfacing with the NIH leadership uh, in then formally structured meetings with senior personnel from the FDA, the CDC, you know, that, you know, and the goal was very quickly, you know, the, the goal was quite simple, which is what are we going to do? <laughs> How are we going to get vaccines? Remember then we didn't know, number one, could you develop a vaccine? Number two, would it actually work against the coronavirus? We don't, we didn't have previous examples of vaccines being effective against coronaviruses. Uh, and then in parallel, there were therapeutics, uh, you know, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals, et cetera. So, you know, to me, one of the questions to ask now is how can that model be applied going forward? You know, what are the key lessons? In the last two years, far more people died of cardiovascular disease than of COVID-19, but we don't have the same sort of urgency. We don't have the same sort of committees. Why not? Well, shame on us. What should we learn going forward? How can that kind of collaboration model be used to address diseases with huge public health import? I don't have the answers right now, but I think those are the key questions and they're being asked uh, uh, in all parts uh, of the ecosystem right now. Did anyone else want to comment on the role of regulatory agencies? All right, well, let's move on to um, what I'm sure will be a, a question that will elicit much, much discussion. Um, so uh, uh, several people have said that IP is overrated. <laughs> and in fact, um, maybe more so because our patent system, as Sandy suggested, is, is perhaps going the wrong way. Um, but the questioner says, but every VC and industry partner spends an inordinate amount of time working with our office negotiating rights to such IP. So it may be overrated, but people are still obsessed with it. So um, is there you know, something to be done to lower those transaction costs of negotiating bespoke deals over IP in every case? Well, that's where master agreements uh, you know, can really help because the IP sections there, if you've got a template, that can be modified or customized for a new agreement. You're 90% you're of the way there. If you're negotiating from scratch every time, uh, it's going to take a while. So uh, again, th th this is not rocket science, but uh, it can really help speed the process along. And, and the reality is, you know, the parties often start with a very different view of the IP. You know, typically the PI thinks there's tremendous IP here. We look at it and say, I'm not sure there's anything at all. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's where we start. Um, but again, if you've got a framework in place to have that conversation, you know, these are solvable problems. <laughs> Yeah, this 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 addresses uh, the point uh, I, I meant to bring out when I urged that universities and industry representatives need to meet halfway uh, at some point around perceived risks and how to manage them. Uh, indeed, uh, I've seen just what Dave described: uh, university uh, inventors uh, believe that their IP is priceless. Uh, companies don't place that value on it, but the tables quickly turn when the companies are demanding uh, rights to uh, uh, activities that, aren't, that are only loosely related to uh, the, the, the research contract at hand. 
uh, wanting reach through rights to related research across the whole university. So I've seen a number of uh, otherwise meritorious deals founder uh, because parties couldn't come to some reasonable agreement. Um, and I think uh, the, the, uh, there's mistakes being made on both sides. And I was just um, noting um, that the questioner was probably also a little more skeptical perhaps of the ability to do a master agreement because things get so individualized. Um, so maybe that, that was part of the burden of the question as well. Right. Marianne. Yes, I'd like to talk about this trend of um, venture philanthropy, which the last time I looked at the um, science and engineering statistics was funding as much res university research as industry. And we see there that there is a movement towards including IP stipulations in the research contracts. And so then that sort of shifts the emphasis away from the technology licensing office to really the sort of stipulations that the researchers would be working under. And in looking at this and, you know, Faster Cures is an example and their name kind of says it all, right? They are trying to um, address specific disease conditions and to fund research that will provide cures. We thought that researchers might not like this, but what we found is that they liked having this sort of removal of ambiguity. Um, and also, um, you know, the idea that you were participating in a community of scholars working towards some purpose. Um, you know, I'd mentioned earlier this unfunded mandate and you have to ask yourself if universities are not, you know, sort of why are they doing this? You know, we could say, well, it's the law. They've got to have technology licensing offices. But in many cases, I think that IP has been like a lottery ticket, right? That you could like, you know, you could um, sort of patent your IP and license it and you might make it big. And one of the unfortunate things, and I really do love Rebecca Eisenberg and Bob Cook Deegan's article on universities as the fallen angels of Baidol that there was a view that technology licensing, rather than being for the public benefit, was going to be a revenue source. And I think that that's something that we, we need to keep in consideration. And I think it's causing this dissatisfaction with Baidol. Well, those are provocative statements. Um, does anyone want to jump in on that? I think it's... Um... One has to, again, be very thoughtful about who is the sponsor and what are the metrics that they're using? Uh, and are those compatible with the overall mission of your organization? Um, you know, MIT is in a fortuitous situation because we are such a great university. Others are not in that position and are under pressure, as we've alluded, from um, faculty and others for research funding. What's interesting is uh, in a number of universities that have gone to a model, for example, of uh, uh, giving away IP essentially in, in exchange for research uh, contracts, um, most of those that I'm aware of have been sort of an opt-in by the faculty. Well, guess what? The faculty who are really entrepreneurial that are doing the really cutting edge work, they, they don't opt in on that. So you kind of get what you pay for, right? Um, okay. Um, other faculty, uh, there are cases uh, where uh, in certain fields, uh, pharmaceutical being one, you know, in exchange for, uh, I mean, given the costs of taking a, a molecule of product to market, there are faculty even in, in leading universities that would prefer to take uh, an, a, a payment, additional research payment in exchange for uh, additional uh, access to intellectual property. But it's a Sort of an individual uh, decision subject to the policy of the the overall university and the like. I think that the um, we found, for example, um, that there isn't a whole lot of action for MIT anyway to look for money from sort of venture sources. We organized a few years ago uh, something called the Engine. MIT set up a, a venture fund 
uh, that we're the managing partner of. We took money from uh, wealthy individuals, not from companies. And that uh, has been very successful. We've gone a second round of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to fund what we call tough tech. This was a, a vision of President Reif uh, in acknowledgement that many, um, many kinds of inventions take a decade or more of investment before they have something that's commercially viable. So that's one route uh, where um, we're trying to address um, getting uh, funding for, uh, in this case, spin outs from MIT to help um, uh, have economic impact, but over a longer time frame. Again, I think a lot of the large corporates, um, uh, you know, they have multifaceted interests in, in universities. So, so you could discuss with them, you know, sort of the trade off of IP versus recruiting. Uh, I heard just last night, um, I had dinner with the president of the UIDP. He was telling me of, of a university that in the AI field, one of the, the large AI companies uh, was wanted to recruit, I think it was like five faculty members in AI, you know, in multiples of their salaries to come in to, and the president of, of that university went and talked to them and said, look, basically you're going to be eating seed corn here. Why don't we come up with a, a way that uh, we can structure some agreements where uh, PhD students could work, let's say, for two years at the university, finish their PhD uh, in, in your company. Uh, let us train the next generation of people in data sciences, because that's what you need. And if, you, if you're just going to hire people off of the universities, you're, you know, you know, over the longer term or medium term, you're, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, so I think we, we've got to come up with creative ways uh, to do it. An interest I just mentioned, I was going to mention later on another question. About four years ago, we started out of corporate relations. I realized that there was a lot of interest in the large corporates for access to spin outs in a, in a systematic way from MIT uh, with either IP or they were just founded by MIT uh, students, staff, or uh, faculty. And so we set up the MIT Startup Exchange. It has over 1,400 MIT connected companies. And we're finding a lot of uh, partnerships um, between the large corporates and these spin outs from MIT that are not necessarily about investment in those companies. It's about creating uh, partnerships with the smaller companies because the large corporates, I mean, they can scale, they can distribute globally, they can provide equipment, they can provide materials. Uh, they, and more importantly, often, they have an understanding of the market that a small company just does not have. And that's sort of the case. A lot of companies spin out from MIT. They think they know where the market's going to be for that invention, but it turns out that's not it. And so they have to pivot. So we're, we're finding that that's a better way to engage even the, the venture arms of the large corporates is by saying, look, let's, let's look at spin outs from MIT and have you develop uh, partnerships of varying degrees with these companies. And that's taken off like a rocket. That's been a very successful model. Not everybody can do, but a lot of universities, I think, could do more of that kind of a partnership creation. Yeah, I, I agree with that as a fertile area <clears throat> for, for useful future action. Um, the dialogue we've been having at Duke with major corporate groups who uh, express some interest in partnering with us is first to say, what's the problem to be solved? What, what's the problem uh, that uh, is material to the future of your company? Not so much in the short term, but looking out at a five or 10 year horizon. And what assets do we have uh, inside of Duke uh, that could be brought to bear on that problem if we can set up the right uh, contractual terms? And often that involves the kind of uh, uh, personnel uh, exchange that, that you were mentioning. Uh, uh, students and or even faculty moving back and forth from the university to the company. Company representatives embedded uh, in the university for periods of time. And, uh, but the underlying rationale is let's solve a, solve a big problem together. Um, that, uh, that's what gets me most excited. I think Carl brought up uh, you know, one interesting thing as well, which is sometimes there's not actually a, a, a transaction at the heart of these interactions where we can often provide value to a PI is the PI comes and says, I'm ready to, to spin out a company, or uh, I really think I've got something here. We look at that and say, okay, here are the next set of experiments that you need to do. Here's the data you need to generate for this to have real value. And that, 
you know, and, and then, you know, let's get together again in a year, uh, you know, when you're, when you're able to generate those data, we'll see where we are. That conversation can, you know, return, you know, uh, you know, there's an immense return on those kinds of conversations because it can help the PI. And then, of course, it gives us line of sight to what they're working on so that if there's an appropriate time to partner, we've already got a relationship. So, so these more informal sorts of discussions, I think, cannot be underestimated. Yeah, it's about the relationships. Um, I, I see two uh, missteps being taken uh, with greater frequency than I'd like to see. One is where faculty members actually uh, spin out the concept too early. Um, in other words, uh, it leaves the university, goes into a company, uh, often because they had access to small amounts of venture money, but that company has not been created in such a way that it actually has the capability to prosecute it. And so the idea of founders when it might have might have been fruitful. Yeah, um, just because you can start a company doesn't mean yeah. that yeah, there's so I the see. right moment. <laughs> and, and that um, is, is one of the uh, dangers of, of having these uh, university related venture funds. We have several of those and they do a lot of good work. But I think sometimes uh, faculty uh, uh, are, can be misled. Uh, the other fundamental problem, and I know this very well because I lived it myself as a scientist for 20 years, is when you're a scientist and you make a meaningful discovery, your natural inclination is to want to make the next big discovery for your field. But often that next experiment is not, it's quite different from the experiment that would turn your first discovery into something of commercial viability. And uh, sometimes the discovery scientists uh, don't know how to do that. They don't have the capability to do it. And that's where these industry partnerships that Dave mentioned uh, can really uh, add value. So, Marianne, did you want to add something? It looks like well, you were up. You know, we are just spending a lot of time encouraging faculty to start companies and be entrepreneurial where, um, you know, Sandy, I like this idea that we have to recognize that there's a long runway before something is commercially viable and, you know, sort of address that gap, if you will. I don't encourage faculty to start companies. I encourage faculty <laughs> to start companies that can succeed. Uh, <laughs> it's a big difference. Uh, Although we know that most startups fail, so, you know. Most, they're gonna fail no matter what, even when all the ingredients are right. But if right. the ingredients are wrong, yeah. uh, they're almost doomed to fail. Great, I'm gonna um, switch topics just a tiny bit um, to um, focus on a question that Marianne in particular, I think brought up, which is, you know, to what extent can universities help um, in their regions um, to promote economic growth, not just economic growth across the country at large um, or economic growth in the typical areas where we see economic growth on the coasts, but in less developed parts of the country. Is that a, a false vision or, or can it be done? So Marianne, you're on the spot with that one. Oh, I'm okay. I would love to hear from the other panelists because I no, think because you, you, you started this topic. So, you yeah. know, right. I mean, I think we have, it has to be done. Mm -hmm. We really have to address this. It, um, you know, the idea of the sort of um, regional innovation clusters is a big part of the, both the house and the Senate bill. Right. And it's important because it is distributing activity. And I think that um, you know, part of this legislation should consider the incentives, the funding for the office. And you know, nobody argues for faculty, right? And you know, faculty are such, we're overachievers. So just keep piling on the work and we will do it. You know, and sort of um, we can start companies, we can do whatever you ask us to do. But I do feel that improving the working conditions of faculty, and you know, we're privileged, um, you know, from UNC, from Duke. But when you go um, into sort of the R2 universities, 
they're really workhouses. They're doing a lot of teaching without tenure, without good pay, and that needs to be addressed. And, and you know, there's no, there's no one advocating for faculty. And just to be clear for my, um, just my clarification, um, in order for these R2 universities to be engines of economic growth, the faculty need to be given time to do this or, or like right. how? Uh, okay. Yes, I think time to do it, incentives to do it, including those considerations in tenure. And then also I think the offices need to be well-funded. And, um, and you know need to be need to be able to reach out, and so you know we we really do have this problem in the heartland of the United States, um, and you know and it's something that we need to address. It affects our political situation and stability, and I think it can be done. That's the most exciting thing, right? Um, and it, it's not it's not too difficult. I mean, this is not my area, but I, I would say that, um, you know, other other countries do a better job at this, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. what about the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany? I, I don't think we, we can aspire to, you know, the entire United States is an innovation cluster in every uh, town and hamlet across the country. Uh, I think there's going to be clusters of, of very high tech that emerge in, in different parts of the country. I think that's just a fact of, of life that'll continue. But um, I think if there, you know, the, the, the whole discussion about community colleges and setting up other uh, forms of education, I think at the end of the day, it's about broadening the kind of education opportunities and the training that's made available uh, throughout the country that uh, recognize, I, I'm, you know, listening, I'm a little bit hopeful from what David said you do see this change in where people work, right? And housing prices, you know, in, in parts of the country that have been very low. Um, I mean, New England, New Hampshire, Maine, I mean, a lot of Vermont, my God, the, the price of housing has really gone up as people move out there. Um, so maybe that's a positive thing is that as, as people uh, move out of the very expensive uh, Silicon Valleys or the Kendall Square area of Boston or New York City, that that will be a, a positive a contributor to a, a broader distribution of, uh, uh, of opportunity. That development's act absolutely occurring. I mean, we're building a new manufacturing plant in uh, a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Huh. And it is, it's gonna be, it will be state of the art, highly automated, powered by uh, in part artificial intelligence and machine learning to direct the operations. It's in an industrial park where our neighbors are companies like Google and Apple uh, and, and Microsoft who have large data centers because those are the kinds of people we need to run this faculty, uh, this uh, factory of the future. So, so that's absolutely occurring. There are new clusters of biotech uh, emerging. Many regions are in the US are now vying to be the next Boston or, or South San Francisco, uh, but you're seeing places like Austin, Nashville, uh, you know, begin to develop uh, these sorts of ecosystems. It's, it's, uh, I, the, the next 20 years will be incredibly dynamic. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm not sure how any of us, any of us can predict how it will turn out, but there's no question we're going to go beyond the, you know, small handful of cities right now that are, that are the focus. So there's a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue on this point in in the research triangle here with UNC and Duke and uh, NC State, NC Central, and other universities. Uh, and um, I think um, the the phrase that uh, comes out paramount in my mind is how do you create competitive advantage uh, for a new venture and where it locates. Uh, I think we want to see companies that spin out of our universities to stay local, but they shouldn't stay. Uh, they should go where they can be the most successful. And if we don't create the uh, foundational elements that makes it advantageous to be uh, to stay around us, uh, investors won't want that. It's the wrong thing to do to handicap the company. Um, so that's where the attention is going. And fortunately, we're you know, finding uh, some success in that. Well, and you know, the research triangle is really an example of a, uh, the creation of a competitive advantage over a long period of time. 
So it wasn't clearly, you know, likely that we would have a um, high tech and sort of um, high wage employment concentration in North Carolina. But now, um, you know, we are widely recognized. And so I think that there are things we can learn from that model. And now what we see is through the creation of a lot of startups, we're beginning to attract national companies coming in. So I think it's a, it's a better model than Silicon Valley for other places to use. Of course, I mean, to that point, it's not just the US either, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, David said before, I mean, we're competing uh, for talent uh, or companies are globally. Um, it's uh, so it's, um, I think we, we do need to be cognizant of what's happening in Japan, Europe. Europe, I expect there'll be major changes now with the Ukraine crisis and a lot of discussion of, um, you know, uh, uh, geopolitical shifts in terms of uh, clusters of economies and the like. So it's uh, that's a whole nother set of dynamics that again is, is not predictable really. But. So on that note and relating to our prior panel, there was a question that was raised with respect to universities I think also applies to university industry collaborations, um, which is to what extent are these collaborations supposed to be truly global and promote global welfare and global, you know, uh, uh, benefits? And to what extent are they really supposed to, and I think maybe Marianne was alluding to this, really focus on the US and, um, um, you know, make things in the US better. Um, and I think it, because this is a panel with industry representatives on it, um, you know, Amgen probably considers itself a global company, but to what extent does it consider itself also an American company? Well, we consider ourselves both, <laughs> uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and I guess what what I would question is the is the the framing mm -hmm. of the question as if these are mutually exclusive. I, I think that's that's the the sort of false dichotomy. To Carl's point, it's a it's a global talent pool. Mm -hmm. You know that that is the case. Now there are pressures that ebb and flow uh, on access to that talent pool, but it is. Uh, a global talent pool, and there are areas in the world that are, you know, expert uh, in, in certain things that that you know, and where the U.S. is not the leader. It, there aren't many, to be honest, but that exists. You know, in in our industry, you know, the next big area, you know, is what's called the the golden triangle, which is you know, Cambridge, Oxford, London, uh, and you know, the universities, and now a, a company ecosystem starting to take shape in the UK. Uh, there are areas uh, in Asia uh, where this is starting to take shape uh, as well. So, so you know, that, that dynamic is inexorable. You know, the world of course is changing around us uh, uh, and that will shape how we think about it. But uh, to, to be insular now will be fatal. <laughs> I'd make the same uh, statement about uh, uh, Duke, is, is Duke a U.S. university or is it a global enterprise? And uh, I think it's clearly the latter. I mean, we have major outposts in Singapore and uh, outside of Shanghai. Uh, much of our talent, if you just look at the composition of our faculty, much of our talent is not U.S. born. Uh, so uh, it's both. So we have a question, um, totally switching gears, about university processes being organized around individual faculty and their projects um, as opposed to, and, and tenure, um, as opposed to more collaborative, integrated efforts. Um, uh, some have called the university model, quote, hero-based or heroine-based. So the you know, dashing hero or heroine who's the inventor. Can universities go beyond the individual hero or heroine model? That's from the audience. Um, do we find that has happened um, already, for example, or is the, the question perhaps outdated? I'll jump on that. <laughs> it's not outdated at all, it's critical. Uh, and I have to say the, the most successful startups I've been associated with have been those that uh, drew forth the talent of teams of faculty and not a single person. Uh, they just gave the new company 
greater momentum and uh, help power our, our early success. Uh, and likewise, if you look at our uh, most successful industry relationships, they're not with a single faculty member, but they're with uh, uh, a group that's organized themselves in a way to provide more value. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a critical point Sandy raises. Look, look I, I mean, it, one of our mottos is, is work in teams. If it's not just a slogan, I, I mean, we can't possibly do, it doesn't take a village, it takes an army to invent and get approved by the FDA a new drug. And it's kind of a miracle every time it happens that we figure out some aspect of human disease biology and are actually able to do something about it. There is, you know, and the things that we are trying to do right now to interdict disease are so complicated that in reality, in most cases, no institution or no organization by itself can do it all. You know, so these collaborations are in fact required. Uh, and so, and that's going to be increasingly the case as we go forward. So an, an individual hero may have a, a great insight but translating that into something that has a practical positive effect in the world uh, is a long, arduous process that requires this sort of army. Artie, this is a question for you to answer. You're as a faculty member, you uh, should have an opinion on this as well. Well, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> and so um, I don't know if law professors get to count themselves as heroes and heroines are usually seen as the um, uh, the more shabby side of town, shall we say. Um, but anyway, um, uh, back to the subject matter uh, uh, of our panel questions. Um, a question that has come in from several people relates to, um, hang on one second. Um, relates to whether the government um, through maybe some of the legislation that's going through Congress, but even absent that legislation, are there model programs that the government can use to incentivize university industry collaboration? In other words, um, for example, to just cite one example with which I'm familiar, the Department of Defense has long had other transaction of agreement authority to go around by dole and, and do all sorts of things that um, you know, are, are very much suited to the needs of the particular university industry collaboration to, to um, uh, catalyze that, if you will. Um, so, um, and then I take it there are other, there are NSF programs, maybe Marianne would be familiar with those um, that can do similar things so that we don't need to be cabined to the Bayh-Dole model um, when we think about university industry collaborations. Right, I think in the chat, someone mentioned the NSF Partnerships for Innovation, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the um, industrial, um, and Innovation Industrial Partnerships as part of the Engineering Directorate is really um, you know, a very dynamic group. They also manage the SBIR, STTR program. And as part of the um, Endless Frontier provisions of um, USICA, what we have is the creation of a new directorate that would be um, focused on, on technology commercialization. And so, I mean, I do think um, I am part of a National Academy's study of the Small Business Innovation Research Program. And we realized like that legislation was passed in 1982. So it is in that prior window of opportunity when we were thinking about um, industrial competitiveness. We call it the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Probably it should be the Young Business Innovation Research Program. And there could be a size restriction, um, again, because getting from sort of concept, as Sandy had mentioned, you want to launch successful companies. Well, you no, know, you can do that reliably. You have really discovered and hit on something. And we haven't quite gotten it yet. 
Other thing I want to add that we haven't talked about, and, and um, Artie, you asked us about um, regulatory agencies. Right now, we have so much monopoly power in many industries, um, and it makes it very difficult for um, startups to compete. And, uh, you know, we're seeing um, a lot of these high valuations in certain sectors, while other sectors, for example, energy, have gone underfunded. And, uh, you know, sort of being able to sort of encourage technologies through competition and reducing barriers to entry is another place where government might focus. I'm trying to be provocative. You are being provocative. That's, that's great. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is certainly not a shy agency. And so perhaps it too um, is one of the agencies you're thinking of. There's one simple action, well, nothing simple. Uh, I, I won't use that adjective, but um, there, there's one action by regulators uh, that could make a big difference and that concerns the IRS and tax code. Uh, I mentioned these uh, restrictive clauses in 40-year-old tax policies uh, are inhibiting to research that would otherwise seem uh, to be in the public interest and so forth. So that could be uh, a straightforward fix, one would think. Yes, the, the tax code is definitely um, an area that needs to be parsed. So um, do folks have uh, closing comments? Because you, um, you you have been so interactive that I completely lost track of time and it's already 1246. Um, so we may have to go one minute over in case there's something that you any of you wants to say before we conclude this fabulous panel. Um, so just to thank you, Artie, and the, the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law for the opportunity. It's been a delight. Thank you. Likewise, and I think we touched on a lot of issues that I would consider existential for all of us. So thank you very much for organizing the conversation. Well, I'm, I'm very glad. And, and as you all know, and, and um, Professor Benjamin Stewart will um, reiterate, all of this is um, being recorded and it will be translated into a white paper that we hope will have real policy significance. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Stuart, who's going to give some concluding remarks. And um, Dennis, our executive director, has also joined us for this final session. Great. Uh, thanks, Artie. And thanks to these panelists and to um, all of our panelists. This has been a, a really great conference and has shed uh, a lot of light, given us a lot to reflect on. Um, I think the panels were exactly in the spirit of the Center for Innovation Policy as a forum for independent, balanced discussions of policies that promote social welfare, enhancing um, innovation. I do think some interesting themes came out. I'll be brief, but I thought it was, um, thought it was sort of notable. Um, how many of the panels, I think basically all of them, emphasized the ways in which globalization is the present and the future for, um, for universities. Um, and then some more specific themes that, that, that came out of particular panels I thought also were, were interesting. Um, that the scorecard for an open immigration system um, remains positive. The, cost, the, the benefits uh, greatly exceed the costs for bringing international students, scholars, and faculty from abroad to the US, beneficial both for the US innovation ecosystem and for the world's uh, social welfare. Um, that uh, cross-border border collaboration is uh, important and necessary for universities, but also that we need to understand which elements of the problem are national security versus lack of transparency versus IP, thre IP theft, um, whether you know, real or perceived versus a general fear of lo losing national competitiveness. Um, in this most recent panel, um, a notion this really is a, a pivot point for university industry relationships um, and that universities need to develop new models for those um, relationships with patents no longer um, the primary currency. It's not all about licensing, it's actually more about those uh, those, those relationships and um, making sure, I thought it was interesting, Sandy suggesting um, that both universities and industry should meet themselves halfway. Um, 
And then back to another theme, in addition to globalization for our president's panel, um, real concerns about um, lack of funding, in particular, lack of uh, funding from the federal government uh, and what that will do to uh, universities as engines of innovation uh, going forward. And then uh, closing out where, where we started um, with Michael Crow really talking about blowing up the model um, that elite universities have long um, adopted, right? Not only, not only increasing scale, but also uh, really re-envisioning what universities offer with a focus on a broader array of options to students um, and expecting greater flexibility from uh, administrators and, and dare I say it, um, professors. And then of course the question is, um, are the, you know, which of these models is actually the ones that will really do the most in, in, in the end to both promote innovation and actually you know, increase uh, net social welfare? Um, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say there'd be a range of views from the different, different panelists on those, on those questions. And I thought it was just a particularly interesting and rich conversation, the way that different panels were all getting at a, a lot of the same um, underlying issues. Uh, so as I already mentioned, yes, we will be um, summarizing these in, um, in a white paper and the recording will be available on the Duke Law um, YouTube channel. And of course you can always find more uh, on our website law.duke.edu slash um, innovation policy. Um, as always, um, a conference like this, especially, especially online, um, does not happen on its own. So I want to particularly thank um, Balfour Smith, Kelly Raker, uh, Leanna Doty, Deb Kinney, and Miguel Bordo. This conference truly could not have happened um, with, with, without them. And uh, I just can't imagine. Hard to imagine what life would be like if, if it didn't have a, a great team like that um, working with us. And of course, I also want to thank um, my co-director, um, Artie Rye, and our executive director, uh, Dennis Simon. Um, I, I humbly think that the conference went uh, spectacularly, spectacularly well. Um, also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Duke Office of Research and Innovation, the Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative, and the Duke Law Center on Law, Ethics, and uh, National Security. So please look for future center events. If you wanna join our mailing list, you already had the option when you registered, please go to our website. But let me express my sincere thanks to all of you all who've been attending this conference. Um, I hope it's been as enjoyable for you all as it has been for us. Um, and this ends the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.